back, I should say, to the Product Quest podcast. Thanks for joining us yet again on our journey to better understand innovation and product strategy. My name is Scott Burleson, and joining me as always, my co-hosts Jan Vermouth and Jonathan Edwards. Today we pick up with part two of our conversation with Dr. Min Bassiter. At the end of part one, Min was explaining some unexpected results he found when conducting research on creativity. These research would be the genesis of Men's Innovation Profiler, the Bassiter Profile. So let's pick up the action and learn about how this tool can help unlock creativity in all of us as individuals, as well as when we're members of a team. Whenever you do research, you get a new, you get unexpected results. And here's what happened. Uh, my, I said, look, at, you have to have, you can't just do, you have to have a process. And I said, there's three parts. Define the problem, solve it, and implement it. Three, just three, diverge, converge. That's a process. I'm going to teach him a process. Well, what happened was um, in my results, I discovered that some people like problem finding better than problem solving. Some people like problem solving better than problem finding. And now came the idea of styles. Mm. People have different styles. That's what started it. And then uh, my work began to create the profile and to identify the four styles, which I did from, um, see another famous guy at the time was uh, uh, Guilford, J.P. Guilford. He was a world-renowned psychologist. Um, I met him at the, at the conference in Buffalo and I talked to him and he invented the uh, structure of intellect uh, theory and what he said, instead of one, I, one you can measure uh, uh, smartness, uh, intelligence by the IQ, but there's a lot more to it. And he invented 120 different uh, intelligences. He made it into, into a Q. And he invented the term divergent, uh, divergent thinking. Uh, he found out that there were four principal uh, mental activities people can do, five counting, uh, counting uh, memory, but we won't use that. One was the ability, he called it cognition, the ability to uh, learn by touching. It's what kids do. They touch the stove, it's hot. They, they learn by doing. Now, we send them to school, they, there's different kind of learning. They, we teach them to get the right answer. And he called this um, uh, analytical production, but it was get the right answer. And that's convergent, get the right answer. The next one was divergent thinking, where you can diverge on everything, diverge on trees, divergent on ideas, divergent. And the last one was called evaluation. So those are the four that I use. And uh, there are two different, see, there's uh, two different ways of knowing. One is by touching and feeling cognition. And there's one by getting the right answer, theoretical. They're opposites. The other two is one is called, uh, uh, di I called it ideation, divergent, and evaluation. They're opposites. So I made them into my profile where if you uh, get people who can uh, think differently together, we call them styles. And uh, one style was uh, generation, which combines uh, learning by doing and ideation. And um, then comes... Uh, conceptualization, which combines uh, uh, ideation, but learning by, uh, by uh, an analytical thinking. And then over, you've got uh, implement, uh, optimization, which is combining uh, learning by abstract thinking and evaluation. And you've got implementation, which is learning by, uh, learning by doing, but evaluation. And those four are the styles. And I, I put them together and... Uh, the first one I tried was, I got people say that's pretty good, but it needed a lot of work. So what I've done over the last many years is created five better versions. And that's what we use right now. And they're right on the money. It's just amazing how every time people say, that's me, that's me, that's me. And it works because it's from first principles. It's from, uh, Guilford was a pretty smart guy. And so I took his, uh, uh, now in education, he was trying to get people to teach this, say, so if the kid's got, uh, uh, he's not so good at divergent thinking on uh, words, uh, well, we can plug that. Another guy might do divergent thinking on numbers. 
you know, they were all different uh, categories, but he could never get educators to accept it because you, it's, it's just impossible. Everybody's got, so he basically died, uh, but I've got the stuff and he had a disciple called Mary Meeker. She tried to make inroads, but it's so hard to get these inroads because it's a, it's a hard thing. And uh, th they never got into education, but at least uh, I was able to uh, carry it forward into the structural. Literature. So we go into that in, in the book called Think Better. Uh, that's what we go into. We try to show them that if you understand these simple little uh, things, you can understand how you think. And that'll help you uh, communicate to other people, think with other people and solve problems. That's called Think Better. And Scatterbrains is about teams. And if you get those four styles working together instead of against one another, that's the power. That's the power of the creative process because you've got, it's like a battery. You've got the uh, positive and negative, uh, uh, but they have to be uh, working together. And that's Think Better. Uh, no, that Scatterbrains, but that's the one we're putting out that way. I think on, on, on your website, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, you can make that test or you can go online. Um, Absolutely, I, I yeah. don't remember the URL, I'm sorry, but you can go online and then you can take the test and it will give you results. And I think we here, we, we, we did that test, of course. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what, what was, uh, uh, Jan, what was your style? I am, uh, um, I am quite a strong optimizer. Really? And, yeah, and I was second? scared. I was scared by how how actually precise it was, and I, I felt like, yeah. okay, yeah, that's yeah, that's on the money. So <laughs> optimizers are the most uh, are the ones who say that's bang on. I mean, really bang really? on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's the biggest. Uh, Jonathan, what were you? What was your style? Well, I'm right in the middle. Uh, in between two different styles and I'm right at the frontier between optimizer like Jan and conceptualizer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, so um, uh, I would be uh, very, I'd be very, if I had to predict, you guys are in the business of understanding stuff. You know, that would, did it, uh, did it, was conceptualizer, there, but uh Many, many, many people who are thinkers, uh, teachers, uh, PhD kinds of people are going to be in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, like I think engineering physics was heavy duty <laughs> optimization. <laughs> but uh, anything about thinking how people think is going to be conceptualizing and very possibly uh, the optimization as well. Uh, Scott, I bet you you were a generator. I was conceptualizer. Um, I was quadrant two, but sort of close to the middle. But just as we were be beginning our conversation, we were speculating that we were noticing we were all in the southern hemisphere and wondering that doesn't seem like that would be a coincidence. We just we we sort of enjoy, all yeah. enjoy ideas. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're obviously all on the same way. And for you to write your book, that's conceptualization. You had to think about how it comes together, how it's put together. Now, when you went out on your own, uh, that was a bit of generation. Uh, you're taking a chance. See, generators don't have to know why they're doing anything. They just go do it because they like it. And, uh, and they'll explore where other people are saying, what are you doing that for? But uh, conceptualization is, uh, that's a big um, uh, skill that you've got, which is, I hate writing. I, I, I'm so much a generator. I hate writing. And I um, have always used conceptualizers as a team with me and all the everything all the uh, everything i've written um has been uh partnering with uh, gary Gillade or other people who are super conceptualizers and we can put it together uh same with this book uh that i'm writing with the scatterbrains with richard perez of uh, procter and gamble richard is a super conceptualizer as well as a, a generator and i'm the generator so we have uh, he's able to uh, put something together in a hurry and send it to me and then I'll edit it and, and, and make it. And uh, so, yeah, so uh, th those fit you guys really, really well, I think. Well, you know, something you said earlier, um, how we speak is how we think. Uh, for me, the writing, it was, it was an opportunity. I was, I'm sort of having a self-awareness that my thinking needed more clarity sort of like like a tree like if i'm watching myself to if i can mix a few <laughs> of your stories i'm watching myself yeah. and going 
Well, um, I, I feel like I'm hiding some of my own misunderstandings with complexity and that was uncomfortable. Yeah. And so writing was a, was a way to, it, it was a way to, well, this doesn't make sense. If I'm, if I'm organizing a book, well, I have to have it in a sequence and I have to be able to explain it. Well, look, I've got a, there's a gap here. Well, that's a gap in my understanding. So that it was a way to, to push myself to, cause that was, it was, it was almost uncomfortable uncomfortable yeah. but but something else you mentioned about the um, uh the generations like going out like leaving john deere leaving a very safe company big company yeah. it was <laughs> uncomfortable it was yeah. very scary yeah. but i can tell you out of the yeah. four quadrants the um and hopefully anybody that won't well i'll just say this the definitely the quadrant four um it takes the most energy if that makes sense it's like, yeah. I, like I can still do it i can still act i can still execute on a plan Yep, but yep, it's yep. like, wow, it's like that frog I have to eat. It's like, okay, I have to sort of get up. Yeah. And it's, it's not that I can't yeah. do it. It's just that I, it's not as yeah. enjoyable. I don't know. Is that consistent with how the... How Absolutely. The Absolutely. And you either uh, make yourself do it. So in other words, these are not skills. This is what you like. Yeah. But you can do for it. Like me, engineering physics was, was uh, optimization. I can do it. I mean, I'm an expert in optimization, but I don't like to do it. So at Procter & Gamble, we had all kinds of people. Procter & Gamble was optimization. Everybody, all the engineers, R&D, it was all optimization, you know, so they were stuck. So uh, so if ever I needed, I can do it, but I, I, it's my weakest quadrant. But now, uh, my first book, Power of Innovation, it was a, uh, it was a, a very bestseller, 95. And so I, uh, the right 80s, yeah, 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 very good. Well, how did it come to be? Well, I, okay, I'm, I'm doing all this work, uh, helping people over. I said, geez, I got to write a book. I got to write a book. So I tried to write a book and I was having terrible trouble because you can speak to people, but if you write a book, there's nobody to speak to. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a book. So I, 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 I worked, I worked, and then Larry Crace, uh, very close to me, said, do you know, why don't we try the process? You teach a process, why don't you use it? The fuzzy situation is you want to write a book. So we started with uh, step one, which is uh, what are some possible people who might want to read this book? We made a big, long list. So we said, well, let's pick any person who is in like us, they're, they're walking down a, uh, down the airport and they see a book. They're, they're people like us, ordinary people who want to do, people who want to do better in their careers. Okay. Now, what, let's diverge. What problems is this person having that he or she can't solve? So we made a big, long list of problems. And we started and we, <laughs> we turned them into how might we statements? How might we lead teams better? How might, or how might I, how might I uh, get more results? How might I uh, raise myself above the crowd? How might I, how might I, how might I? Well, we ended up converging and we picked, uh, we, we picked, uh, we did a map, a challenge map, how they all fit together. At the top is how might I became, uh, you know, become the president of a company all the way down. And we ended up with 21, how might we statements. Guess what? Well, guess what uh, we've got in the book? Twenty-one chapters. Every one of those became a chapter. What we did was we got a pool table, a billiard table, and I put every how might I out there, and then everything I'd written we put goes on this pile, goes on that pile. Oh, this is empty. We'll have to invent something here. This pile, this pile, and from then on we just uh, the book just wrote itself, uh, 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 one a, one after another. So uh, that was a case again, like you were saying, if there's something missing, I maybe I got to put something there over here. I got something here. So all the writing I was doing was going to waste without being put together in some kind of a network, which we call challenge mapping. And um, so, uh, I, 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 and again, that Larry, uh, Larry helped me, uh, you know, Larry helped me to do the conceptualization. We were, we used challenge mapping. We, uh, and even though it was not my strongest suit, that's what we did, and it worked. It worked really well. So challenge mapping is always uh, a way of 
uh, get everyone's brains around what's the real problem. What's the real problem? And you come up with it. So, um, um, so the, um, the why what's stopping is the little engine that drives the challenge mapping. You always ask why to go up or why else. What, what's stopping and what else is stopping down below? And uh, so um, that's, uh, that's the way that would, came, uh, that would come together. And uh, what, uh, what it also taught me was, man, use the process. Use the process. Use the process. So we get people to get, we get uh, uh, in a train, we had a train the trainers workshop way back of free to lay people. And the idea was that uh, we wanted to, uh, it was starting to spread through the entire company, Frito-Lay, and in Dallas. And we were making an internal core of, uh, of uh, people who could teach other people. But the trick was that I knew was unless you absorbed it yourself, which was by just, unless you internalize yourself, you can never teach other people. So we, uh, we had uh, 15 people come up in the hotel. We put into five groups. And they had a manual, like, like the manual you've got, uh, which is, uh, you know, this is how you teach the stuff. It's all in there, how you teach the stuff. And uh, you've got four or five coaches who already know the stuff. And what we want you to do, uh, each group, we want you to prepare uh, lesson number one, whatever lesson number one was. And you have three hours to put it together. How are you going to teach lesson number one? And you'll teach it in the afternoon. Okay. Now, the big thing is we want you to use the process. Use the process. So that's, that's the rule. Be ready in three hours and use the process. So uh, off they go. And the first thing I hear, I don't think we need a process for this. It's all in the book. It's right here. So they start dividing up the book into <laughs> sections and uh, time goes on and they get more and more frustrated. They're reading the book and reading the book and three hours go by and they're not ready and they're getting angry. So now it goes into the afternoon and by the afternoon, all three groups are pretty angry, but they've got something. So they start teaching and it goes into the evening, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, because it's, not very good. Okay, so now we have a debrief, and uh, this goes. This is, uh, so now we put them into the teams. They put them in different teams, and it's Tuesday. And we say, okay, now uh, remember, now your job is to teach lesson number two, and the big thing is we want you to use the process. So off they go, and I, I don't think we need the process for this. It's all in the book. And again, it gets awful. And in the debrief afterwards comes a little glimmer of, we didn't use the process. On Wednesday morning, one group says, Every, stuff is in the book. We don't know what it is. The coaches know what it is. We could use the process. They're finished in two or three hours. The other two teams are still having trouble. By Thursday, Two teams used the process to be a no time flat. The third team still didn't get it. Use the process. It was there for you. And it doesn't, what's in the book, you can never, you don't know what's in the book. The coaches do. So use the process. And so we'll never forget that, how painful that was to say, uh, I know the process, but to use it is a different story. So we always use that as an example how any problem you've got, you've got a bulletproof shield. It's a bulletproof shield. It's the process. So you, we don't know how to do this. We got a process to help us. You got the process, get facts, get problem definition, go through. So again, a huge difference between saying, I know what the process versus I can use it. And you can't teach it. Level four, that's level four work. You cannot teach this process unless you internalize the process. Uh, that's huge. And that's why innovation is, everybody wants innovation, but they don't know how to do it. Companies are hiring all kinds of people because the leader has to say, I want innovation. And I think there might be a process that could help me. And this is the, 
if he brings in somebody who can help him with the process, it's a blueprint. Now we start finding fact finding in your company, fact finding, problem definition. You come up with an approach to innovation that's unique to your company. It's absolutely unique. You don't go out and try to buy for a million dollars somebody who says, I can do it for you. I can do it for you. They don't know your company. They don't know how to do this. Your people know. You use your own people inside the company. And that's what we did at Free to Lay. We got, uh, in five years, we, uh, we got people engaged in problem solving all over the company, solving real problems. And we made uh, <clears throat> cost improvement of $500 million in four years. We tracked everything. But you engage your people. They know the problems. And so we basically taught people inside to uh, lead other people in the process, and it worked. And it was unique to that, that, unique to that company. Same thing with Ford. Uh, they said our problem is to get people engaged in solving the problem. That was their problem, employee engagement. They signed a union contract, not about money, but employee engagement. So it worked in a different way with, uh, there. So you have to start with saying, uh, start from scratch. Fuzzy situation, we want to do this. And we got a blueprint here if you only use it. But it, most people are too busy. Most, uh, most top managers are very busy making their numbers, making my numbers. So if there's seven banks and you're one of the banks, as long as I can make my numbers with the other, then I'm okay. Mm. You don't want to try something different. That is, they're going to laugh at you. Now, in your company, in the bank, you've got eight or nine vice presidents. All they want to do is make their numbers, make their numbers. And that prevents you from going out and trying something new. So there's all kinds of new things you could do, but it's safer just to make your numbers. Yeah, and if we were going to process help you. Sorry, if we're going to take the why was stopping, and we took our, our problem statement, something like you know, we, wanna, we want to execute the simplexity system, make it the standard in our company. And if we, were, if we go down in that hierarchy, what are some of the things that makes that difficult? What's stopping us? from being able to execute some complexity within a company. Okay, so we'd say, uh, so what's it? How might we uh, get some complexity used throughout the company? Yeah, if we were going down, first down. What was well, first of, all, yeah, first of all, it's better to go up. So okay. why might you want to use some complexity throughout the company? You kind of have an answer. Oh, I would say to be more profitable sort of comes Yeah, up. we want to increase profitability, okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, so... Um, uh, that's a, a nice jump up. Okay, so where we're going is you've got to have a business need. You've got to have a business need. So uh, what's stopping you from being more profitable? Let's come down. What's stopping you from being, being more profitable? Uh, pro uh, the, our products have low margins. Okay, so uh, how might we how might we increase the margins that are, are of our current products? Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. President, do you think people in your company would be excited by that? I do. Yeah. Well, he says, yeah, we got all kinds of people. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so we have a business. We call it the business need. The business need is how might we increase the margins? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what's stopping us increasing these margins? Um, okay. Customers don't seem to want our products. <laughs> or there's, or many many pick something else. Yeah, many customers do not even. Many customers do not even they don't understand our products. Mm -hmm. How might we get more customers understanding what our product can do? Mm -hmm. Another one is uh, all of our managers uh, are making their numbers. They don't know how to work with other people. How might we get people in this company working together to solve tough problems? Mm -hmm. Now we're getting into more and more things. That's what's stopping us. What else is stopping us? A lot of people in the company don't even know what our costs are. They don't even know what the costs are. They don't care. How about we get everybody to be understand what our costs are? Now you're getting into much more specific things. And out of that, you can fabricate a challenge map. And you need three things. You need a business need. Think of a Venn diagram of three things. If you don't have a business need that people want, you're wasting your time. You got to get people motivated that they say, yeah, we got to do that. Why? Because that our jobs depend on whatever. Second of all, you need a process. You need a... People need to know how to solve problems together. So we got the process. And the third one is called uh, an infrastructure, an infrastructure that's going to allow people to work on that business need using the process. You can't say we're too busy. You can't say we're too busy. You've got to have something. So you say your, your structure might be we're going to uh, 
form problem solving teams around the company and make sure they uh, work on this thing uh, six hours a week or something like that. We call that the innovation structure uh, or strategy. That's your, it's got to be those three. So, and if you don't have ownership for the business need, and that's what you get with the uh, uh, the president at a pre consult. You get them together and say, okay, so you think this could be, what's stopping? And you have to identify something that's motivating, it's a big business need. And at Frito Lay, it was uh, how might we offset inflation uh, as quickly as we can? Because that was eating up, uh, they were accepting cost increases like crazy. How might we offset inflation? Everybody rallied around that. And we measured. Uh, we measured every uh, project that was done. And you measured. Uh, and you've got to get results. Otherwise, you're just uh, in the game. And you've got to be willing to implement solutions. You've got to implement solutions. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, people start saying, and you've got to listen to people. You've got to listen to people uh, with what they come up with. Otherwise, here we go. We're playing a game. They're going to increase our engagement figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They know that. But you start measuring, like, you know, the United Appeal Thermometer? Everything goes up, up. Here's our level up here, 500 million. How close are we getting? And people get excited. Uh, and uh, when I did my research in Japan, uh, first sabbatical, I discovered that uh, uh, the secret, the Japanese good companies like Toshiba really understood the power of problem finding. Uh, they said when uh, uh, when uh, R&D engineers, we hire them every year, just like you do. Bring them in here, PhDs, whatever. They don't get into R&D for two years. We stick them into the sales department. Why? We want them to learn the problems of the customer. Innovation starts with problem finding, finding problems that are worth solving. Customers that. Then we solve them. It's called a product. That's we. We will, don't want them coming in here, and we hand them problems to solve. We're not doing that. They got to discover the right problems. So it was really tremendous to have that uh, uh, th that company to know how important problem finding is, where we can hardly get anybody over here to understand problem finding. They're in a solution mode. Don't bring me problems. Bring me solutions. So, so I have a question. Guys, yeah. Yeah, regarding the, um, the, so once you finish the process of asking uh, how might we and uh, why and what's stopping you, you will end up with a kind of map, a kind of hierarchy of different problems. Yeah, uh, yes, we, we call, problem we call it a challenge map. It's a, a mosaic. It's a mosaic. A mo it's a mosaic. Yeah. yeah. And, and my question is, how then do you identify because this this mosaic could be fairly extended and and exhaustive. And how do you focus on the right um, the right statement in this mosaic? How do you know where you should focus in in this mosaic? Well, uh, how, uh, one question is how long do you do it? And it depends. Number one, how important is the problem? And second of all, you have an owner in the group, and when he says, he says, "Is this does this?" Are you satisfied? Do we have it? When he says yes, you're ready. So he it's, says, it's, yep, it's, I, it's I, the I people in the company. Yeah. yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, and uh, so I had a similar question back to the coast example when um, when it was selected um, of be refreshed. Did did you did the company feel like you needed like a survey or consumers to confirm that or how did you have confidence in that as the selection? Um, they were very excited about that problem and the uh, concept. And um, you mean that they the did not in the room? You mean the participants? They, they, well, what it was, they, they ran the blind test. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was the confirming. They had a blind test, a winner, and they were eager to get going. Uh, okay. So um, uh, consumer research and that stuff is provide good information back. And I mean, they could have. They could have run exhaust. Meanwhile, Irish Spring is making millions of dollars with the red green. So in the real world, it says, hey, we like that. We'll go. And now they had to uh, obviously get acceptance from uh, uh, up, but uh, it was it was ready to go. Can and I... uh, yeah, so, so, so... Um, yeah, the amazing is is 
uh, you got to have the uh, you got to have the o- the o- critical to have ownership. If you don't have an owner who's willing to risk his reputation uh, and an owner, uh, you don't have nothing. You get the right people in the room. You've got to say, who do we need here? Uh, you know, uh, is it just our uh, our engineers, or are we bringing some people? Uh, if we're trying to solve uh, a homeless problem, we better bring some homeless people in here. You know, etc. Get the right people in the room, and then you depend on their knowledge to help you generate possibilities and to and, and to choose. And you're never sure. I mean, how do you know you picked the right one? You don't know. <laughs> one famous one famous phrase is, "How do you know it'll work?" I don't know it'll work. Well, we got to try it. But there are people who the killer phrases. That's a big killer phrase. How do you know it'll work? Does anybody here know it'll work? No. Are we want to try it? Yes, give it a try. And it, it, there's nothing wrong with trying something. The worst that can happen is it didn't work, and you got to do it again. But uh, but they want to know how they are very and and companies punish mistakes. I, yeah. Procter and Gamble is a very different company from when I left it. It was very conservative, and we had people working on a uh, on a product product. <clears throat> And um, they uh, developed a product and um, they w- took it to market test and it didn't come out very well. They were deathly afraid. They were punished. They were punished yeah. for running a market test didn't run well. You know, and that's the way it was, punishing mistakes. So nobody would even try something unless they were sure it would work. And we've gone a long way from that right now, but that's the way it was. And I think there's a few companies right now who are like that. They know how to punish mistakes, but they don't know how to give people a chance to try something. You try it, you'll learn something. But I and feel it's a like different kind of leadership. I, I feel like still that is so that that still is very often the case in 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 a lot of companies. Despite maybe and this is where I get a little bit well upset, kind of yeah, upset in a kind of sense with with people, especially uh, consultants, I got to say, who, who propagate this idea of fail fast, fail often. I think that's very easy to say if your job is not on the line. Like, <laughs> I think it's very fair to say that from the outside, I can say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you just try it and we'll see what happens. But but I think there is a reality there in a lot of companies where, where you're not measured by, you're not measured yeah. by uh, how much time you spend to understand the problem, which is a shame, but that's it's the reality. Yeah. You're not measured by yeah. the amount of yeah. times you try to find it. So, yeah. so I think the incentive system and the way that in a lot of companies is set up, it's and that's a reality. You kind of have to find your way around in innovation. And I think your 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 process and how you do it, ownership, get, get, kind of taking everybody along, getting to agreement, getting going beyond consensus. Is a great way of doing that. It kind of, I feel like also it shifts the perception of what it means to be successful, what it means to 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 measure an idea or a process by. Yeah. Is that fair to say? I don't know. Oh yeah, that's uh, totally right. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, data. We have huge amounts of data. Only sixteen percent of people, managers, etc., uh, are generators. Only sixteen percent. Um, our problem finders. Uh, over 45% are implementers. We teach, basically we teach implementing. People are taught implementing. And um, uh, that is a problem. And um, uh, if you want to truly be innovative, you can't wait for somebody to hand you a thunderbolt that says, here's the magic answer. There is no such thing. All you have is you have a process they can help you develop more innovation in your company, which is unique. And uh, the uh, problem with uh, generators is they are so far away from the uh, end, uh, uh, the end result, uh, more uh, uh, successful product or cheaper this or that, that by the time their idea goes, nobody remembers where it came from. Yeah. So people have a lot of trouble rewarding generator work and, uh, um, uh, we're writing an article right now. I can't tell you too much about it, but uh, trying to get people to say, if you, uh, you've got to find ways to bring more problem finding into your company, this is what you've got to do. 
you've got to honor all four styles. They're all vital. But the one that is least likely to be um, uh, hardest to measure is that one. So you've got to find ways to measure, measure the benefit, find what, what, what good they're doing, honor it, and you got a chance. Um, otherwise, you'll still be waiting for that magic thing to come along. Somebody sells you something for a million dollars, and it doesn't work because it doesn't <laughs> Because nobody knows your company like you know the company. So that, that's really important. You, yeah. you need to turn innovation into a process. Yes. It's a process. So, anybody can learn the process. Shop floor people can learn. Anybody. It's a simple process. Very simple. But it, they, uh, you have to ignite it. And you have to give it time. If you're spending all of your time implementing or, you know, the trouble with six, are you familiar with Six Sigma yeah. and uh, Lean? Those are strictly trying to save a few pennies and a little bit, they continue, they're continually improving the same process over and over again. But instead, you've got to be able to define, go to the management of the, and define the problem. What problem are you really trying to solve? And sometimes you can find a brand new process, which will obsolete that process. Yeah. But, but there's a huge yeah. opportunity there for What's funny is that some people, uh, spe more specifically in the in the design space, coming from design, would actually uh, uh, say that it's exactly the opposite, which is which which happens. They would argue that, for example, so so we had this guest on um, a few episodes back, Jan Sch Schmidgen, and he said a really nice uh, phrase, which is, uh, "You have to co-evolve problem and solution," and so. This kind of leads me to a question, uh, which is, do you think it's possible to actually totally define a problem up front? Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think you have to, you know, really you should um, uh, treat it as a fuzzy situation. I think uh, there's, only one, there's only one way to be sure is use the process. As soon as you assume you got the right problem, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. Because you're not using the process, you're just going into uh, into solutions. So uh, what what we try to do is uh, for people who are, who are not who are non-believers, say yes, I know you got the problem. Uh, could we just do a little fact finding and to uh, be make the problem more precise? So you don't say to them, uh, you don't know the problem. Yes, you got a problem. Can we do some fa fact finding? That's step one. Do some fact finding and uh, this. Or you can say, okay, uh, could we just take a few minutes to sharpen up the problem? Can we ask why and what's stopping? And that way you can get people to say, okay, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. But if you, as soon as you say, uh, we know the problem, uh, we know what the problem is, then, then you've, uh, you've, blocked your, you've, you've blocked yourself and you're, down, uh, you're going down a path. But it doesn't take very long to redefine the problem if you're really sure. Yeah, but, but I feel like uh, there the is. Problem is a... I'm sorry. I, yeah. I, sorry, I was. I didn't yeah. want to interrupt. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just feel like there is there is enormous power in 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 this reframing of the problem, and I think That's if it. you can really if you can really get people to, I mean, this is sort of what we try when you talk about jobs to be done and all that. Refra kind of getting people to think in a different way about the problem, and that. And the way now you explain it, this sounds sounds so easy. <laughs> like yeah. how you do it and how you get people to 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 think in a different way about the problem. But I think there is enormous power in that. Yeah, I think the word reframe. I think most people are willing to accept reframe. So, like, could we take a couple of minutes to, uh, to reframe the problem or just check it out? And by doing the why, what's stopping? Um, I think most people would be willing to buy that concept. And it's it's at least better than nothing, and um, and uh, and I, I so reframing is a is a good a good term uh, to use, yeah. We, we, uh, but I have to say I, I am wondering um, to which extent. So, for instance, a really radical innovation such as let's say uh, uh, I don't know Facebook is what comes to mind. It's something that really never mm -hmm. existed before, which is of course a solution to. Uh, a problem but i wonder if the process to actually get to something like facebook would have come out from a 
um, like a, a process where we define the problem totally up front. Um, I, I, mean, I read a very interesting book some time ago, which really made an impression on me uh, by Kenneth Stanley, and it's called uh, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. And the whole idea is that basically sometimes taking steps towards, uh, towards solving something counterintuitively, counter um, if you think you're getting closer, you're actually getting further away. So it's a bit like being in a maze where you think that you're getting closer to the exit, but actually you're, you're moving further away. So for instance, yeah. um, if you had to try and if someone told you to invent a computer, said comes from the future, like oh, we went to the past and said, there's this thing called a computer you can invent. Um, and you didn't give them any details of how to actually get there, probably they would find it very difficult to actually get there because getting there involves a lot of accidents. Um, for example, uh, inventing vacuum tubes. People had no idea that vacuum tubes would lead to uh, a computer. Uh, in the end, it did, but it would be very difficult to predict that you have to invent vacuum tubes in order to get to um, a computer. And so what I'm wondering is, is uh, are there different modes of, of, of going about the, yeah. this innovation process? What, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on this yeah. approach? Yeah, uh, see, uh, if you visualize the wheel, it's, uh, uh, the process is round. Uh, and um, uh, we have uh, people who uh, want to, uh, they want to uh, invent, uh, they want to invent. And sometimes they don't know what to invent. They're in step one. Some people have an idea. They're already in uh, step four, they got an idea. And uh, so, uh, so to help them uh, say, okay, now if you got this idea, you got a new way of, uh, uh, you got a new way of uh, uh, helping people with their, uh, their heart uh, uh, thing. Now, what to, we go backwards. Now, if you say, okay, uh, now we go back to the problem. What problem are, is that going to solve? And you got to say, I got the solution. What problem is it going to solve? So we go back to three from four. And in that, you try to define the problem you're trying to solve. And often it can be uh, something that nobody would ever want to buy it, or it's pretty good. That's the real problem I'm trying to solve. And then you can come back again. So the wheel works that way. And that's key. You got an idea. Uh, some people want to know how to implement and they got an idea and they've done that and they don't know how to implement. And a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, institutions try to help them implement. They know uh, great at, at how to implement it. But this one is uh, working way backwards, working way back. So uh, I think um, uh, uh, what job, uh, one thing that Jobs was uh, famous for was conceptualization. Uh, he didn't really, sometimes there would be a, somebody already had an idea or a challenge. He would spend months and months thinking about it, thinking about it, conceptualizing, thinking about it. And when he finally understood it, uh, he was able to then uh, uh, then activate it, make it go. So he did a tremendous amount. Uh, on the other hand, um, Edison was famous for problem finding. What he did was he wanted to make money. So what he did was, he invented a whole bunch of problems that people might have. Problems, problems, problems. Uh, he thought of the problems, and then he would go to investors and say, which ones do you want me to solve? And the one they would put their money into, that's the one he would solve. So he's a really great problem finder. Uh, so uh, you, so the, pro, the, the it's a thinking. This eight steps is kind of a thinking device where you might be... Um, you might have an idea and go backwards, or you might not know a, a darn thing. You got to you got to do some pro, uh, market research, problem finding, blah blah blah, to come up with something. But it gives you a guide as to uh, what, and then a team can talk to each other. Where are we? Are we problem defining or are we implementing? It gives you a communication device to talk about how we think together, how we think together. So uh, maybe maybe that answers your your question. Yeah, it's, it's um, great. Thanks. Yeah. 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 I, I know that with the computer, I know that in about 1971, we had a bunch of nerds who were, just had a black box that they were hoping that 
if you put this in here, it'll go here, go here, it'll come out there. And that was kind of the original uh, original little uh, had computer. And they worked on it, worked on it. They were so delighted when they could do a rudimentary thing come out. And they kept on working on it. But uh, in, in their minds was if we could use have something that could be used to uh, you know transform this into that. So they just worked and worked and worked. And uh, that's another one where... Uh, you know, the first, there's an old saying called the first 90% takes 90% of the time and the last 10% takes 90% of the time T doing the painstaking work to make it better, make it better. And as you're going, of course, you're learning, oh, we didn't do this, we did it. That's why we have the wheels round. When it comes up to the top to implement action, what you trigger is new problems. Um, uh, so the automobile would be a great solution once upon a time to how might we improve transportation? However, do we not have all kinds of problems the automobile caused? We have tons of yeah. pollution, insurance, et cetera. So the wheel is round because every implementation takes you around the wheel again. And failure is nothing bad. It just means I, I failed, so I go around again, I go around again, I go around again. And uh, I guess that requires a lot, a lot of patience as well. They say that... Um, I think 89% of startups fail in five years. Uh, and I think it's because many people have an idea that they try to push to the end yeah. and it doesn't end. If they would uh, spend some time up front with uh, problem definition and working together, uh, there might be, might be fewer because I think we're solution oriented. Got an idea. I want to make a bunch of money out of it. Uh, got an idea. That's and so, so often it doesn't yeah. work. Can I, so since I don't know, I don't want to, jump in too much but i have i have one question i'm i have to ask and i i, I really wonder about this so in, in in the eight steps i mean there's problem finding fact finding problem definition then idea finding evaluate and select plan and then there is a, a for me a very interesting seventh step where you say acceptance gain, so before acceptance. action there is acceptance yeah. can you talk a little about that because i, I feel like that that's there is a very strong insight hidden because you can say okay we got a plan so now now let's do it so why step seven well because uh to execute your plan you're going to uh, run into a lot of people who don't like your idea or don't like the plan and think automatically think of negatives uh, and be and often they're the ones who have to do stuff uh they got to do it so unless they understand where this idea came from uh that that's that's a problem uh, now, often you get around that by including them at the front. The more yeah. you include people yeah. at the front, the more they buy. And the second of all, uh, yeah, uh, making change is hard. Uh, you know, it, it, you're probably going to need a lot of creativity in implementing. How are you going to implement it? You're going to have people. Oh, uh, there's an old saying called uh, people don't resist change, but they do resist being changed. Huge huge mm. and uh the worst thing you want to do is uh put on the bulletin board at three o'clock in the afternoon this is a change everybody's going to be against it nobody knows where it came from they just they're suspicious whatever so um uh, so getting uh, getting things implemented is hard another reason it's hard is because people are busy 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 and uh so they don't take the time to uh get the uh idea sold understood uh, bought in, and uh, so that it's hard work, and uh, automatically, uh, usually, uh, usually uh, uh, people like you. You go into your boss with an idea. Your boss is happy. He's a happy guy. Everything's okay. All of a sudden, you're going to make him very uncomfortable. You're going to say, "Boss, I'd like ten thousand dollars to do such a." Now, he's folding his arms. Uh, you, you made him uncomfortable. So but the trick is to try to realize that you will make people uncomfortable because you're suggesting a change. We all prefer that. So now you got to find a way to uh, get people engaged, present the idea in such a way that you reduce their discomfort with the new idea. That's where psychology comes in. The psychology mm -hmm. is we like we we don't like having somebody try to change us. We, we don't like that. But if you help, uh, we'll buy into it. If you include us in the change, 
we like change. And that was a famous uh, research done in 1948. Uh, Koch and French, who discovered this in uh, 1948, that's where they'd, uh, they worked with coal miners in England. And they found that the biggest thing was they found that if you engage people in the change, people don't mind change if they are part of it, but they hate it when you're trying to push them. And uh, another thing that's happening is many people make a living by saying, I'm going to help you. Uh, I'm going to help you manage change. Oh, okay. How we, well, they chose them how we're going to foist change on people. We're going to get them to do this. That's not the way to do it. You get people involved in making the change. So making a change is very different from, pu from pushing the change. Um, so managing change is not doing it to other people. You've got to go through managing it. How are we going to make it happen? And then, uh, then it's much faster. But right now, uh, people, all sorts of ideas, how we're going to have people agree to the change. You know, make them do this, make them do this, fold their arms, whatever. And you're pushing change on them that you've already developed yourself as opposed to engaging the people in your co uh, company in, figure out how to make the change. Man, when we've worked in hospitals on this, what we do is uh, if the uh, president of the hospital really wants to change, he wants to reduce uh, uh, waiting times, Yes, I do. Well, we get uh, his medical director and the, phys the top three people to have a pre-consult of, do we want to make this change? Yes. Now, next thing, we engage a steering committee of the top eight or nine people from billing clerks all the way to physicians to become the team. They're going to be the team that figures out uh, how we, you know, what we're trying to change, to find the problem. And then we start engaging people below them to solve the problems. They know where they came from and then we engage people to implement. But in every case, they've got to be part of everything going through. And uh, so that's using the process where you deliberately want to manage change, not do it, uh, not change people, but uh, uh, get people engaged in the change. People love it. Man, I have to reflect on a big professional failure where I did not do step seven. Uh, back with John Deere, I've got a big trophy on the wall. You can't see it up there. It's the John Deere Innovation Award. We won this. It was a big product failure, but it sort of jumped to the conclusion. But we won this award because we came up with this tractor that drives like a car. We had all, we had a mountain of research showing that people had trouble with all the complicated controls. It was we had, I believe we defined the problem well. We had a pretty high tech solution. Nobody needed to us know it was high tech. It was a tractor. You get on it, the controls look familiar. So if you're not experienced, you hop on there and drives like a car. But when at that point. We sort of took it and threw it to the marketing folks and we went on because, and I'm looking at your profiler, right? And I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm not as interested in the, in the category and the quadrant four activities because they're not as fun for me. And so, yeah. and what, so what ended up happening is for, for that tractor to, to sell, dealers needed to order it. They needed to be prominent in the website. There are lots of other people that needed to understand the story yeah. and promote it. And I didn't do any of that. I didn't do any of that. And so dealers didn't order it. it but it was sort of interesting uh, when it was rolled out. We'd, we rolled everything out at this big event in Florida. And you would have dealers come and look at this tractor driving like a car. And m most of them say, ah, this doesn't make any sense. No, the, I, I know I know how to drive the current tractors. I'm not interested. <laughs> I'm not going to order one. Uh -huh. yeah. But every now yeah. and then, you would have a, a salesperson, a dealer salesperson come up and go, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. But then you talk to them a little bit, guess what? They're a brand new salesperson. In other words, they have low tractor knowledge. Yeah. They were in the target targeted market. And so I look back on that failure with a bit yeah. of amusement because I don't think, I don't think the, I think the problem was defined well. I think the solution, of course I'm speculating, but I think the problem yeah. was defined well. It's, I think the solution addressed it well. But I think we failed at that step seven, uh, and I failed at that step seven. I didn't spend the yeah. effort, energy. Honestly, I was just probably more energized in finding the next problem to solve. And it, this is more obvious yeah. than at the time. Yeah. But um, as, you, as you're describing that step seven, I think that's, um, I, I think yeah. that's can be large. I think that that could have been a pretty big success if if we had gained the, the acceptance of people who needed to take the baton from us and, and run with it at that point. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's uh, we uh, we uh, try to teach uh, gaining acceptance, and by saying uh, what, what's the idea, and the next thing is uh, who do you need to convince? Yeah, and uh, we have to pick the right. We have to write the, uh, the who who do you have to convince, and you got to go through that and say you got to find the right people, and then you got to say um, okay, uh, if that's the right person, what problem does that person have? that our idea might help, might help. Okay. And you got to figure out there's some problem he's got that might help. Yeah. And then we go into what are the benefits to this person of this idea? What objections might he come up with? And you have to prepare a real, you got to give that step credibility. You got to do it right. And uh, you got and the right people say, are we trying to sell to the dealers or are we trying to sell to um, old uh, retirees who who are we trying to sell to yeah. and now that can, let's diverge first let's diverge first and and also get the right people in the room you know get those get those consumers in uh, who are going to be the judges judges and if you're going to do market research make sure you're doing market research with the right people with, with the right people uh, yeah. i have nobody to blame but uh but myself because i have this binder uh, simplex process technology, creative problem solving. Um, I can tell you, so I don't even want to say how old this is because it's been a, it's been a long time. But since I took your course the first time, and I, I, it's hard, it was hard for me to overstate. Well, when I took it, it was like this divergence and convergence. These are things I had never heard before, and, and a lot of that is why today, like some like there's some modern notions of design thinking. I'm often not to pick on design thinking, but I'm often underwhelmed a little bit because I'm like, well, look, I've 25 years ago, <laughs> we, we were diverging and converging and yeah, you know, your process is just, um, it's amazing, uh, tried and true. And, you know, I'll say it's, it's just has a lot, you have all the tools. We, we've mentioned a few, why, what's stopping that list of four questions you threw out there. And it's, um, it's, um, it's quite a treat, man, to, uh, all these years later to connect again. And um, it, it certainly, um, as I've learned new methods and other innovation things, you, your process will always be like the foundation that where I initially understood innovation and everything else sort of layers on top of it or, or makes sense. So yeah. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that so much. I, I, uh, you said it very well. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's it's a, basically a foundation. Everything else sort of piles on top of it, and actually, uh, we we so we is we we do design thinking. We just don't call it that, and we do a, it's a superior kind of design thinking. But because we have we understand problem definition, which is absolutely critical, yeah. and we also understand ownership, having the right having the customers in the room. Yeah. A lot of design they're missing things like that, uh, which which are just fundamental. Uh, to the process. And uh, of course, we've learned that the hard way by being in situations. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, a lot of times I think I was uh, 30 years ahead of my time because I was doing that already way back when. And now now, now we're trying to talk about it. And uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's really fun to, t yeah, I read, I, you know, I, I, I read your book and I see, uh, uh, all of the stuff that you got in there and how you've done it. And it's, uh, and I, I love the idea of the statue. It took me a while to figure out what statue in the stone was. Cause I used to teach that they used to say, Michelangelo, how in the world can you do that? And he said, that's already in there. I just chip away the parts. And, and I still didn't get the, uh, didn't get the title, but now I, I got the title and it uh, takes a long time to get people to, it's okay to talk about it, but it's okay to kind of understand it. And, step by step to do it, to do it, to do it, make it better, say these words, drop these words. And uh, that's again, the simplicity, the simplicity is, uh, is, is key. And that was our, our first, our, I've loved how that was really our first opening words. And it's such a great, and it's funny that I, I bought, I said complexity by accident, but um, because I, I think, I think there's so much in that, um, in, in getting beyond the jargon, and getting be in and helping us to communicate with each other as teams, with with what you, as you call the owners, with customers, stakeholders throughout. It's like 
and I also love the image of the log jam. Like what it might be, might not even big little, but what's the thing that really breaks things free that can unleash lots of other value. Yeah. And um, well, it's just been a, a wonderful conversation, but as we're kind of wrapping up here, what's, what's next for uh, Dr. Man ambassador? Uh, for me? Yes, sir. I, I've got to get uh, these two books over the goal line, scatter brains and think better. Yeah. We're in the short strokes of getting out there. And it might trigger interest in what we do. So we'd like these books to be out there. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, oh, then, uh, of course, I've got two sons uh, who are uh, working in the, who are basically taking this forward, uh, Bob and uh, Tim. And they're, uh, uh, they're, uh, uh, they're a good team of uh, uh, getting people to, uh, sell, uh, uh, call, uh, Bob is a uh, great business development, getting people to try, understand, make it easier for them to use. Um, and Tim is a great teacher uh, and they work well, well together. So uh, uh, that's like looking for like, you know, there was a, <clears throat> a saying I like, which is the larger the island of knowledge, the greater the shoreline of wonder. And like, it's amazing. I think what, uh, what Ryan, we're talking about 1% of the population. If, if that, there's so much more to be done, centuries more work to be done. So uh, I'm, um, uh, one thing I'm doing right now is I'm working with a, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Goran, who's a great, who's a professor of uh, strategy. And we're shoring up, making sure all of our copyrights are, uh, are solid. Uh, we have a, uh, have a group in uh, McMaster who uh, is expert at this and, and they're helping us. We are trying to, um, we're going to develop uh, a huge market, I think, is professors. Uh, people who like to teach innovation but don't know much about it. And we're trying to create a, um, a production where they can, uh, it'll be hands-on, uh, what do I say, a standalone <laughs> that they could give their students to learn. And they don't have to pay for it. The students will pay for the uh, profile and make it uh, simple and convenient to do. And we think there's a large market where we can get the, um, the real knowledge about how you do innovation to them without a whole lot of, they don't have to invent it themselves. There it is and get their students. So that's a big one. We're hoping to have this production done by the end of the uh, term. And we think there'll be a, a large number of professors who have said, I'd like to teach it, but I don't know how this would help them. And they don't have money. Mm. So you don't have to have money. You just have to learn and let the students, just like they buy textbooks, they can, they can buy the profile. That's a big one that uh, is, I, I really, uh, I have not worked so hard ever since the pandemic started because I had to retool everything. Yeah. And uh, wow. then new opportunities have come out. And uh, so uh, basically, uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to say I've got a hobby. I've turned into a job. And, uh, and so I, I, I don't begrudge the time in front of the computer and getting stuff done. So I, there's, a, there's a few things that are going on. I probably forgot some other ones, but uh, there's so much to be done, so much to, uh, to be done to educate people. Well, we, as a student of yours, we certainly appreciate it. So folks out there, you can find me at ambassador.com. That's B-A-S-A-D-U-R.com. Uh, keep an eye out for these two new books coming, Scatter Brains and Think Better. Also, you can find several of other men's other books on Amazon, The Power of Innovation and Simplex, A Flight to Creativity. Now, man, I have just one more final question. This one's a little bit different. Imagine you were to assemble your own innovation conference for creativity and you're going to select a movie for us all to watch together what movie are we going to watch and why uh so we got a whole bunch of people to watch a movie <laughs> uh it would be uh i as i call a movie a, a movie of your mind i'd like everybody to imagine they're in a movie theater and they're watching a movie and who's the star of the movie <laughs> they are Mm. And what's happening in the movie is there's an idea they've got that they are implementing. It's, it's, it's successful. It's being implemented. <clears throat> Who's in the movie with you? Who are the people with you? What are they doing? How are they helping you? Make it very concrete why this is going to work. See in the movie, call it movie in your mind. 
and you're visualizing an idea you've got being implemented and just see who's in that movie, what are they doing, what exactly, and what are they doing to work. So that would be the movie that uh, they'd be watching. They would make up their own movie, uh, seeing themselves implementing an idea they've got and seeing how it actually is going to work. Wow. Write your own movie. Watch your own movie. Create your own ending. I love it. I think that was, I yeah. think I'm quoting um, Kermit the Frog from the Muppet movie <laughs> at, that, at the end of the movie. Well, that's fantastic. All right. Well, fellow travelers out there on the journey with us to better understand innovation, you need to know the name Dr. Min Bassiter. He's a pioneer in our space, and I'll always owe him a debt because his simplex process was the first end-to-end -end innovation process that I had ever seen back when I was a young engineer. I still have the binders on my course on my shelf, and I still refer to them. It will always be the innovation process that I use as my foundation for understanding the rest. And that, friends, concludes today's Product Quest podcast. Please send any comments or ideas for future shows to productquestpodcast at gmail.com, and we will see you next time. And I'd like to thank Jan and John. That was a great conversation. Very deep. Thank you. Thank you. I really, really, really appreciate it.